Shook had an apartment full of producers and said, look, either y'all start producing some hits or I'm going to start producing some hits. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for fun? Um, think of to do. <laughs> I watched straight out of Compton and then I realized it's your son. I approached him. I'm like, yo, I want you to play me. He was like, okay. And I was like, that came off a little too easy. <laughs> we have Kevin Hart right on after you. <laughs> Owe me some money. I bet him he was going to end up being more friends with Rock than me. After he did one movie and his groupie <laughs> is over there with the Rock, <laughs> left me behind. I don't like all this hurt waiting. I want to just roll. I know, into it. I know. It's like you, the, a lot of fumbling bags going on right now. We got we have Ice Cube on sitting on the couch next to us. We're sitting here like, yo. I'm sorry, Mr. Cube. All good, man. You know, I'm in your house, so. <laughs> We're actually ready. at the Hi Mat, which is yeah. a great place to record podcasts. It's extremely quiet in here. Welcome back to Impulsive, the number one podcast in the world. Thank you guys for listening, watching, viewing, and subscribing. Listen, I have a text on my phone. It's from Kevin, my videographer. He's sitting right there. It says, Cube is on set. How y'all making him wait? Caps. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you got here 15 minutes early before us. Well, if you can't be on time, be early. You know what I'm saying? That's my motto. Can't do either. This is what separates the greats. From Honestly, us, dude. Damn it. <laughs> we saw you getting out of your Bentley when we pulled up, and I was like, we fucked up, dude. Yeah. It's all good. You know, I, I expected us to start at two, so <laughs> it's all good. Oh, it's 159. 159. You know what I mean? All so right. so it's all good. You guys are actually early. So, you know, usually they say we're going to start at two, and then it's 2.30 before we... Finally, you know, check the cameras and the mic, and then we start. Well, so. that's what we never know what to expect. You know, so, some of our talent, as you know, you, you've dealt with talent. Yeah. They'll kind of just show up whenever they want. Yeah. You know, they do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, me, I, I like I like being on time, you know, because I know time is money. Everybody time is valuable. Um, So most of the, most of the time, you don't have to wait on me. What's that saying? Punctuality is like a sign of the gods. Cleanliness. Yeah, I think that's it. I think I think there's some saying about punctuality yeah. and how it's important. I think you. I think you nailed it. <laughs> Listen, uh, uh, we have an intro for you, but I I think any intro that our producer Dylan wrote was probably not even sufficient enough to to explain all the stuff you've done, dude. You're a create creator of culture for decades, and you've done so much. And to be honest, this is this is one of our biggest episodes, and we're honored to have you on, man. But why did you do this show? <laughs> because y'all the shit, you know what I mean? Y'all y'all the shit, and uh, everybody knows it. So, you know what I mean? It, it's just, it's only right to be able to, to speak to you guys and your audience and, uh, you know, let them know I'm the shit too. So, well, Thanks. I think they already know yeah. that. It's also a it's also a big week for you. the The Lakers are crushing it. Yeah, yeah. you know the Lakers. Well, they made it into the second round. I, I mean, crushing it. I don't know. <laughs> second round, yeah. Uh, but we'll see. Everybody counted them out. Everybody thought they was trash. Um, but you you can't count out champions. Um, and and you know we got champion pedigree. And so, don't do it. Is LeBron James the greatest basketball player of all time? It, there's no way to measure that. I'm not an all-time guy. He hasn't played in all time. So, mm. you know, everybody, he's, 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 he's probably the greatest in his era. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and so that's all you can be. Like, you only have your era. You don't have all time. Mm. You know, who knows how he would have played in the 60s when he had to damn near take a greyhound to every game. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you know, he's a great player, but, you know, athletes are treated 10 times better than they were before as far as facilities, transportation. You know, they got masseuses and shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they got, they got rubbing their feet. <laughs> you know, so... Um, Better conditions, better athlete, maybe. You know, you never know. You know, how would how would uh Bill Russell play if he could fly fly, uh, fly private every game? You know what I mean? Would he have, you know, 15 championships? Who knows? I wonder that all the time, specifically with sports. Like, if you were to pick an athlete like Jesse Owens and put him up against Usain Bolt with today's technology, right, in a race, 
or in 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 advancements in health, would he be faster than Usain Bolt? The the difference in uh, generational progression is fascinating to me, and you you actually were a huge part of that, in, at least in the hip hop industry, and uh, sort of shaped the way hip hop began and, and and started its revolution in the United States. Do you do you look back at the impact you've made and are you able to understand the footprint that you've left on the industry? In, in some ways, yeah, but you know, you got to give credit to the ones that came before me too because they taught me how to be a pro in this game. Um, you know, I grew up in um you know, hip hop was just starting. But I but but there was superstars already before I even started rapping. Mm-hmm. So um I give I give credit to those greats. And then, you know, it's cool to come in and make your own mark too. And uh be able to uh, you know, to start, you know, a, a style, a flavor, or era, you know, um, but you know, I look at the people before me too, so it's hard to say, you know, I started anything. You know what well, I mean? You, you definitely. It's, it's hard. It, it's just hard to to give myself that credit mm. when I know, you know, there was, you know, a decade of superstars before I even hit the map. Yeah, but you need those flowers because you definitely put the West Coast on the map. Like, who was doing? What was the state of West Coast hip hop prior to NWA? Um, a bunch of guys trying to make it, a bunch of groups trying to blow up. Um, you got, you know, the the hottest group out here before NWA was a, was a group called, uh, the LA Dream Team. And, you know, they, they actually did an album called King, Kings of the West Coast because they were so hot out here. And so everybody thought those was going to be the guys that, you know, their music was more um, radio friendly. You know, they they rhymes and they hip hop was danceable. Uh, it was popping, and you know, the underground groups were struggling. Like, uh, and then you had you had people like uh, King T, who was doing hardcore hip hop. You know, so called gangster rap even before N.W.A. Um, you had Ice T, of course. He was the first one to take it nationwide yeah, yeah. because he was embraced by the New York, um, you know, from the Zulu Nation to all the Karras ones, just the New York, uh, you know, the, the best groups at the time. Ice T shot me. <laughs> oh, shot yeah, that's you. right. I forgot shot, about that. Ice T shot me. He killed me on Law and Order SVU. Oh, okay. I was about to say, <laughs> damn. What you do? You must have messed with one of his dogs. You know what I mean? He loved them dogs, but uh, he shot you on. He shot you on the uh, on the show, dude. I have such an embarrassing story. Uh, so embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. I was on. I was on Law and Order SVU. It was my first role I got in like tra- <laughs> traditional Hollywood anything. Yeah. And uh, this guy comes up to me. And he's and he says something like, "Hey, like, h- how you doing, man? Like, good luck on your scene today." And I was like, I was like, "Oh, thanks, dude. Like, what, what do you, what's what's your role here?" And it was Ice T. Oh, oh damn! God. Yeah, and he goes, he goes, he, he laughs at me. He goes, "All right, man," and then walks away. <laughs> and then in this scene, he gets to shoot me, and he kills my character. I was a bad oh, guy. Yeah. He I'm was not, probably so. He happy. probably liked that. Yeah, he, was probably, so he happy. probably like, you know what? Let me shoot him. <laughs> And rewrite this scene. Sorry, I, I had I had to mention that because that was that was my first taste of Hollywood getting shot by a legend. <laughs> Terrible taste. <laughs> Pretty good, you know, to get shot by Ice T. Yeah, it was cool. Can't say that. It was cool. It was cool. It could have been Vanilla Ice or something like that. No, yeah, I got yeah, shot yeah, by yeah. a legend. Yeah, though. yeah, for sure. You yeah. talked you talked about East Coast and obviously like New York City started hip hop, right? Like we could all yeah, agree no on that, right? No doubt. And and years later there would be this massive. Uh, you know, beef between Pac and Biggie and, you know, East and West. But what was the relationship like with East Coast hip hop when you guys started? Like, did you guys have a relationship with them or was there a conversation? We or? was fans. Yeah. You know, we were fans. We studied, you know, the best groups out there. Everything that was coming out of New York, we studied it and um, embraced it and um, sharpened our tools 
you know, with with those great artists, those great records. We sharpened our tools, we, you know. But we wanted to kind of carve our own lane because doing imitations of what they were doing wasn't working for us. So we started to carve our own lane and just like, let's just talk about the shit that's going on in the hood. Let's just talk about what's going on around here. And if we just become neighborhood stars, that's good enough. That's better than what, what that's better than what we are now mm -hmm. and shit, you know, so... Once we did that, that's when we got our niche. Everybody really started to pay attention. And we love New York, and we was embraced by the East Coast. Um, but it was an undercurrent in the industry of people who, you know, thought that our, our, our records was too hard. You know, our records was, uh, you know, not real hip hop. You know what I mean? It was just kind of just uh, like street records. And and so um, that was just kind of in the industry, you know, with the with the writers and the DJs and the and the people that made the industry kind of click. And then it kind of reverberated a little to the artists. You know, I think, you know, before Biggie and Pac, you know, uh, Tim Dog had a record called Fuck Compton. Um, and that was just kind of out of the blue. And so it was just, you know, those kind of things just uh, kind of came to a head with Big and Pop. Right, right. Yeah. I, w I was going to ask, uh, because, you know, as someone who at least would like to consider myself a trailblazer in a sense, kind of just hacking away in this forest, no, no real blueprint for what we're doing. You did that on, on such a grand scale. But how did you and your boys have the balls to essentially give the middle finger to traditional media who was trying to make this narrative go a certain way when it came to hip hop, especially in the face of back then racism? Well, we knew like at the time nobody was paying attention to what we was doing or saying. We felt like we was just talking to each other. And so they didn't matter. You know, and we realized they don't matter. And we'd still be underground if they didn't come, you know, worried about, you know, what we was doing. You see what I'm saying? So um, that was our attitude is we not worried about them because they're not our audience. They're not the ones that's going to um, benefit off this or they're not the ones that go through what we go through. So... They not they don't understand because we knew what we talk what we was talking about was real, but we knew they didn't understand and so we didn't care because they was just lame, you know what I mean? They just they don't get it. They not us. <laughs> they yeah. not going through it. So why should we ever listen to to them? I guess just because I don't know, like the authorities or 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 people painting you the wrong way in the limelight that didn't worry you guys not at all because that was happening anyway mm, mm. you know you don't have to do nothing for the police to mess with you you know what i'm saying mm. so that was happening anyway so why worry about what was already happening in the anyway so you just do what you do and kind of let the chips fall where they may summer's <laughs> coming guys you guys gotta get ready for summer Get your band bod ready for summer with Manscaped. Manscaped is here to ensure your body's ready. <laughs> you sure you want to cut the first one out? <laughs> Manscaped is here to make sure your body is ready for the wild with their game-changing full body grooming and hygiene products. Don't be the guy at the beach with Austin Powers chest hair. And if you grew some winter man tits, the least you can do is make sure they're hairless. It's time to get ready for hot guy summer by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code. Logan, I'll tell you, when I'm shirtless in the WWE, I feel great having no body hair. Manscaped is dedicated to help you increase Increase your confidence and level up your full body grooming game with the Performance Package 4.0. The kit comes with the Essential Lawnmower 4.0, waterproof, cordless body trimmer, and a ton of other liquid formulations to round out your grooming routine. The trimmer is best on the market. It features a ceramic blade designed to cut hair on loose skin and reduce grooming accidents thanks to advanced skin safe technology. Inside the Performance Package, you'll also find the Manscaped Crop Preserver, Bale Deodorant and Crop Reviver, Ball Toner, and Anti Chafing Ball Deodorant and Moisturizer. The Weed Wacker 2.0 for nose hairs and Shears 2.0 nail kit for your feet. You also get two free gifts. Woo! 
Having the right tools for grooming is essential. Do yourself a favor and always use the right tools for the job. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code Logan at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code Logan at Manscaped.com. Thank you, Mike. It's from Manscaped. Yep. Now back to the show. We didn't think we were ever going to be big artists. You know what I'm saying? We thought we was just going to stay underground. That's crazy. Because <laughs> the music crazy. was so hard, we didn't think nobody was going to... Like want to play it or want to be a part of it unless you really understood what was going on. And so we felt like at the time, it ain't going to be too many people to understand this life or what's going on. So we probably only going to sell a little amount of underground records. Did, did that lack of pressure uh, that you felt prior to the commercial commercialization of hip hop do you think that was a, a funner time for you creating before it was fully embraced by like the entire culture? Like, did you have more fun when it was just you and your homies kind of like doing it just for yourselves and for your, like just for a small group of people? Um, I don't know. You know, in a way, you spending somebody money that probably ain't got it. So the pressure is on. Yeah. Like Easy's coming out the pocket, paying for these records. Mm. So... We want to make sure you make his money back. So you want to make a hit record. You want so there's still the pressure there. Even if we didn't know we was gonna sell a lot, we wanted to at least sell enough so he he can make his money back. Even if he sold him out the trunk, you see, of his car. So that was our philosophy, and actually, you know, going through the industry, doing your thing. You know, as an artist, you get to a point where you like, I don't care what the industry think. I only care about what Ice Cube fans think. Mm. And and that's the freedom. That's that's when you're having the most fun, when you cannot care about charts or sales or this or that or numbers, and you could just make your fans happy. And, and you worry about them. And everybody else can come along, but... I'm not thinking about them first. I'm thinking about, you know, your fans is like your clientele. Mm. You want to keep serving them what they love and just serve them and everybody else will come along or not. Yeah. But these fans, they'll keep you eating. They'll keep you relevant if you serve them and you give them what they like. And when you can do that, I think uh, is when you're free as an artist to 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 really explore you know your depths and the things that you you know really about it's crazy how y'all didn't think you were going to become as big as you became you know you were you were just you were essentially curating for your fan base but that's it surely there was a moment where you, you looked around maybe you were performing or, or i don't know counting your money like oh damn i think we're on to something it was when uh mtv banned the video ah what was it? Which video was it? Straight out of Compton. Yeah, yeah. They they wouldn't play it, and they banned it. And me, Rand, we young. We in our teen. We still teenagers, so we don't understand how much publicity, you know, how much that actually makes people want it. For sure, for sure. You know what de I mean? De so, platforming anything just draws so much attention to it. And all you know, easy record company, they kind of understood like, this is like an oh shit moment. Like, uh -huh. like, they talking about this on the news. You know what I mean? So that just was the moment where things just blew open. And, and then there was no, we were locals at first, you know, we was just relegated to Los Angeles and the West Coast and Arizona and Texas. You know, it was kind of a West Coast thing. Yeah. And then and then boom, you know, now they want to hear, they want us in Chicago, they want us yep. in Detroit, yep. they want us in New Jersey, New York, uh, Philly, you know, we're, we're, we're nationwide, you know, then worldwide, uh, you know, you got one, one, one uh, station in Australia for a protest, they played, they played Fuck the Police. For 24 hours straight. No oh way. My God. <laughs> Looped it. 
<laughs> that's kind of yeah. been like the battle cry of you know anti-police sentiment since that song was made but but and that leads me to another question like as you guys saw this upswing of momentum and popularity across the world you also saw an upswing in backlash and i know you know it's probably maybe easier for you to sit here now and say like we didn't really give a fuck what anybody else said we were just making music for the fans but bro this shit got to senate y'all like two senate floors y'all were the first people to be canceled like gangster rap was one of the first groups of people <laughs> to be effectively like tried to at least be canceled yeah what was that what was that time like because i i always remember the beginning of that um bone thug song uh we're not against the we're not against rap we're not yeah. against rap rappers but we are against those thugs yeah how did it feel to be like labeled thugs and to be labeled like criminals and just and, and that was all your your value was um i mean we had to grow up fast you know, because now we we go from being living our dream to now being political um, spokesmen for our generation. Um, so I was ready for it because my favorite artist was that anyway. You know, people like Chuck D and Karras One. Um, even George Clinton, you know, they was rebels. Bootsy Collins, Rick James, James Brown, you know, the rebel mentality. Uh, so I was I was ready for it, and I embraced it. And, um, you know, I had wrote a lot of the songs, me, DLC, MC Ren. And so I understood um, the focus. And so, you know, I was able to just let let people know that this was really happening. You know, we're not we're not just making making up lyrics. You know, this is, you know, we putting it in music. Sometimes we put it in a comical form, you know, but we still talking about real shit that go on. And so you're not going to discredit that just because you don't want to hear it or it makes you nervous or you don't think it should be on a record or whatever, you know what I'm saying? You just can't deny that it exists and you can't deny that this shit we doing is way more positive than the crimes that we talking about on the record. Mm. Right. You know, if we was just going out doing that, we'd be criminals, you know, mm. but now we're artists cause we're able to paint a picture. Interesting. And that conversation has continued. I mean, you, you're seeing it now with like YSL and Thug and like all those guys. Like, do you think there is ever a time where, you know, a, a record can can be used uh, effectively in a court of law? Or do you think that that, that music is always I music? think it's dumb. It, you know, it's like pulling in Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and saying, you know, you did this movie Terminator and you... you, you you kill cops in there, so <laughs> we want to bring you in yeah. for question. I mean, you know, we want to try you for that, or or bringing in somebody like uh, Stephen King and saying, "Hey, you wrote this scary ass book, and we need you know you gotta be held accountable for yeah. for chapter seven, <laughs> of yeah, but the yeah, shiny. But just you know play. what I'm saying? It's kind of like that's that's how stupid it is to. To pull a, a rapper in and say these lyrics, you know, uh, point to 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 you know you're a criminal because you wrote a, wrote lyrics like this. Now, there's always a separation. There's music shit and there's street shit. Now, if an artist don't realize he's a music, he's in the music business and continues to do street shit, then you got street shit consequences to that. So that's a whole different thing, you know. It's kind of like, but, you know, I can't be on trial for one thing and then somebody start pulling out, you know, lyrics from America's Most Wanted in 1990 yeah. and start saying, you said this, so you must have did what they're accusing you of. You know, that's bullshit. I want to I wanna back up a little bit and talk about how you – uh, Dre and, and Easy E like came together. Like, how did y'all link up to to create NWA in the first place? Um, I met Dre when I was uh, about fourteen years old. 
And so he, uh, his cousin used to live down the street from me, a dude named Sir Jinx. And um, I started rapping and, and, you know, I got better and better. And then one day he came over to Jinx's house for a barbecue or something. And, uh, and then I, he was able to hear me rap. Now, Dre was already, he was already part of the Wrecking Crew. They was already doing parties all over the city. He was DJing. He had a record out called uh, Dr. Dre and Surgery. And so he was like the most famous person we all knew. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so to he heard me, he heard me rap and he and he just liked me. And so, you know, he started to come over more and more. And, you know, I started helping him write rhymes for the wrecking crew. And you know, some of the rhymes we we wrote actually got them a little more uh, status in the city. And so Dre used to do these mixtapes called Traffic Jams for the radio. You know, like 15-minute mix while you in traffic and whatever, you yep. know. And it was new. And so he would want, he want people to rap on the front of it because he got tired of making these four-track things. So he would ask me to rap. And um, I started rapping. It, it wasn't a record, so I started rapping about the neighborhood. And that just caught on. Like, people wanted more and more and more of that. And so we kind of found our niche. And then Easy, him and Dre knew each other. They used to do parties in Compton High back in the day, but they fell out. Easy started, you know, he started uh, doing his thing and shit, you know, in the streets. And so they lo- they they lo- they lost contact, but anyway, these mixtapes was going around. Easy found out that Dre was involved with putting them together, so Easy found Dre, and he just started hanging, paying attention. And uh, Easy wanted to be a manager. He wanted to to have rappers and have a label and all that business and, side. Yeah, and. Um, he brought in these rappers, you know, it's in the movie. He brought in these rappers from New York. And uh, he asked me to write a song for him because I had wrote a hit song for with uh with the wrecking crew. So he uh I wrote a song for him and they hated it. They hated the shit. It was it was called Boys in the Hood. And then Easy, <laughs> you know, Easy ended up doing the record because Dre convinced him, like. You got a voice, man. Fuck this manager shit. You got a voice. You got a style. You got flavor, man. Do it. And so he ended up doing it and rest is history, you know? So crazy. Yeah. And, and you guys end up having this like fruitful, you know, obviously, you know, trio and relationship for a long time. But eventually, by way of, you know, business dealings and other situationships, situations, you guys kind of end up having a falling out, you and yeah. you and easy. Um, and you know, you fast forward a little bit of time after that and he, you know, passes and becomes one of the, you know, most influential people on the West coast ever passed at the time. Well, still to this day, um, what was your relationship like with easy at the time of his passing? Like, had you guys found a way to, to reconcile or. We had just reconciled. Um, you know, I met easy in 80, 84. And um, he he put out the record Boys in the Hood in late '85. Um, we did more records in '86 and '87, but by '89, I had left. So I really knew him for five five years, and it was it was mixed more with business than just hanging, you know even though we were hanging and kicking it, but all of it was wrapped around the music industry. So when we broke up, I hadn't seen him for years because I'm doing my thing, he doing his, it ain't really friendly. Um, but then I saw him at a, at a club in New York called The Tunnel. And um, he was with Bone Thugs and Harmony. They was just blowing up, you know, they had, um, Crossroads had come out and it was just huge. So we we got a chance to talk. We just sat and talked and we talked for hours, just 
about old times, you know, could we get it back together? He was beefing with Dre by then and, and Death Row. And I was like, yo, you know, work that out and I'm here, you know. And um, and then that was that was the last time I seen him. Um, and so, oh, so last time I seen him alive. And so uh it was cool to be able to to finally just get all that shit behind us, you know what I'm saying? And laugh and joke and have drinks and, you know, be talking about shit that happened and um and get a chance to have that time with him before he passed away. Man, time does really heal all wounds. It do. And it's not always easy to just hope that that's going to be the case because time takes time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Things happen slow sometimes. Mixing business and friendship, so, you know, sometimes can get tricky. That's real. It does. Um, and, you know, if we was friends before we did music together, then I think uh, maybe it would have turned out different. But, mm. you know, it was kind of a business relationship mm. in a lot of ways um even though we had a lot of fun together you know for sure uh, i considered him you know at the end a friend um and not just you know a business the, partner the, the leader of nwa you know what i mean yeah, yeah. there's there's a I'm, i hesitate to even ask you this but i want to there's a conspiracy theory oh, online yeah. involving Shook knight Oh yeah, what's that? So, <laughs> oh fuck. <laughs> oh, no. So obviously, like Shogun and Eric were were beefing, right? As, yeah. As you as you said, with Easy Easy and Shug. and um, Easy obviously ended up passing away as a result of complications of of AIDS, yep. AIDS virus, right? And uh, there's this there was this interview done with Shug. I don't remember exactly when it was when he talked about how you got to kind of get creative in how you kill someone. Like you can't just like shoot somebody, right? Like, <laughs> like okay. The, and, and, and the way that he described yeah. his preferred method of, of taking care of somebody was, was airily reminiscent or, or um, like, like similar to, to like how easy passed. And by the way, this, yeah. keep in mind, this is not my fucking conspiracy, bro. Like this is an online conspiracy that I've just read about. And I wanted to ask you about like your thoughts on that. Are you saying Suge Knight gave Easy potential? They're saying that the, the conspiracy says that Suge Knight could have potentially been the person that gave Easy AIDS through a how, through an how would he do through that a, through an intravenous needle? And 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 Easy would never tell anybody that. No, maybe Easy didn't this, even know because you just you just poke somebody like and and they don't even know. Maybe they they were at a club or some shit, you know. No, nah, I think if somebody poke you with one of them goddamn needles, you know. <laughs> you know. Stupid ass. You know. I mean, I told, I'm, I'm I just told saying, everybody I would ask. I'm just I'm saying, sorry. you know, just just say this happened. Easy would tell somebody, this motherfucker poked me with some shit. <laughs> no, but it does happen. It does happen in clubs. Remember, oh, Dylan, no. What didn't it used to be a thing for a while where, like, people were doing that? And, like, you, you might not even know. Now, if notice. he was unconscious, and I don't know. You know, it's like. I don't know. Um, it just sounds crazy. Um, I is, mean, is it, it just sound like it, if if Easy would have known he got poked, he would have said something. Um, if he didn't know he got poked, then the conspiracy lives on. Would do you put it past? I don't Shug? put shit past nobody. I was gonna. I was gonna ask. Isn't Sugar a little unhinged? I don't know. He ran someone over like twice. <laughs> like he went, he ran him over and then back, backed over him again. I, I don't know about that, but uh, <laughs> all I know is saw it. Um, no, 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 he still doesn't know. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it is what it is. I can't say somebody's unhinged. Yeah, I, I had one Suge Knight story, uh, kind of like my iced tea story. I, I was coming to LA for the first time. I was still in college. I was eighteen. And I didn't know who Suge Knight was. I went to uh, Studio 71, yeah. my first talent agency, agency, talent yeah. agency that signed me. Yeah. And, and manager Jeff was there. And we were meeting in the boardroom. And I hear some screaming outside. So I'm like, some shit's going down. And it, there was, I walk out, I peek my head out this this conference room. And there's Suge Knight and Cat Williams shaking <laughs> down the CEO of Studio 71. Talk about, <laughs> talk about, where's my money? 
I, I need my money now. And I'm like, I'm like, Jeff, what the fuck is going on? And Jeff, my manager, who's like, you know, he's experienced in Hollywood. I'm not just some, some dude from Ohio who like mows lawns. He's like, that's Suge Knight and Cat Williams. And I'm like, who's Suge Knight? And that's when I got the brief on who this dude is. Yeah. <laughs> and then we stayed in the conference room. One of the funniest stories I, I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, I just heard it, is that uh, Suge had, a, had an apartment full of producers. And they, I guess they wasn't Producing. coming up with the right songs. Yeah. And he gathered them all up and said, look... Either y'all start producing some hits, or I'm gonna start producing some hits. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, see, that's why I start thinking to myself. Maybe my question's not that dumb. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a I lot mean, of conspiracies that, around Shug. That was bro. that was a pretty good one. Oh, he, oh, <laughs> there's a lot of conspiracies around Shug involving involving Pac, involving everybody, Biggie. Man, everybody. but I mean, the man to tell you what he did. You need to get an interview with Shug. He'll tell you. Is there a chance we can get him? On I the mean, podcast? he's locked up, right? For running people over. Well, for yeah. a number, of th he's still in prison, right? Yeah, yeah, he's still in. I wouldn't yeah. ask that question if he was out of prison. Damn, dude. I, thought, <laughs> I mean, he'd answer it. You know what I'm saying? He seemed pretty open. You, uh, slight detour. Are you into conspiracies at all? I believe in some of them, yeah. Which ones? Yeah, most of them. <laughs> <laughs> How the pyramids get built? I mean, I don't know about that. I wasn't there. Me either. What, what other one, big ones? Oh, do you believe in UFOs? Um, yeah, do you I do. Do you believe that there could potentially be like footage, for example, of like a UFO landing that someone's like hiding and not sharing? No. Yeah. You, oh, you don't think so? I don't think nobody's hiding nothing like that no, and no. not sharing. <laughs> really? <laughs> not nowadays. Yeah, everything gets out. Everything gets out. Are you an Elon Musk fan? Uh, I wouldn't call myself a fan. Anti-fan? <laughs> hater? Huh? No, I'm not a hater either. Just neutral. I'm just neutral, yeah. I, I just look at the guy. He's doing some pretty crazy stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I, I catch myself looking at him sometimes, too. Yeah, I yeah, mean, you know, yeah. he's, a, he's a smart cat at the head of, you know, a lot of cutting-edge yeah. shit. So you want to see what, what he's thinking. We should have him on. I know, obviously, full set. I don't, did, just but don't know if it's that easy. I, I know think know? we can get him. I think, <laughs> I think here's what we should do. I think we should get him on, and I think we should do me, you, Cube, and Elon. <laughs> no Would problem. you be down for that? Yeah. Do, do you, are you a fan of anyone nowadays in pop culture in any realm? Like you're paying attention to him going, okay, I like what this person's doing. Maybe not Elon Musk and his, and his Neuralink. I but. mean, a lot of people do a lot of cool stuff. Yep. You know what I'm saying? That yep. I'm into, you know, I'm into people that, uh, you know, push the envelope a little bit. Yep. You know, not a lot of bit. You know, I'm not into the Weird satanic bullshit. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But I'm into... You know, artists, you know, going for it, you know. Did did Drake pay you $100 so he could open up for you in 2006? He didn't pay me shit. <laughs> <laughs> he he must have paid that to the promoter. You're saying, you're saying, Drake got $100? Drake got, $100? Got, Drake got a, yeah, yeah that, he, Drake the got promoter paid must have paid him. That was, the yeah. that was the story. What, he went on yeah. an interview, right, and said that he opened for... for he got $100. See, I mean, if I'm on official, if, if it's a official ice cube tour then i pick everybody that's on the tour mm. but if it's just me spot dating here and there the promoters sometime i get there be that cousin opening up i don't you know well, so do you remember, they work out deals do you remember drake opening for you i don't remember that but i i do remember somebody bringing a cd on my bus from a youngster in toronto and the shit was pretty damn good. Yeah. That's what I remember. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and and I keep thinking that had to be Drake's. Yeah. Where do you put where do you put him in terms of like the I, I know you don't like superlatives and best ofs, but like where do you put Drake in terms of like hip hop in general? I mean, he's amazing. Yeah. You know, guys like him and Kanye and you know, anybody who can I mean, even Lil John, people like anybody who can do their own beats and lyrics, like they gotta they got a, uh, they got something most people don't have. Most people go get producers, and they have to be produced. You know, guys that can actually do everything from scratch. You know, it's just next level. It's I, like a guy that can play football and basketball, basketball yeah. in the pros. Yeah, you know? I've always been a huge fan and had so much respect for multifaceted people. 
especially creatives. And and this is a good pivot, actually, because I wanted to ask you, who you are, you're rapping, right? And then eventually you, you, you're doing a business acumen. But I think the the thing, the asterisk with you that not a lot of people have is the creative side of you, you know? Yeah. You're, you're creative. You like to write. Yeah. And uh, none of them can do what I do. No, it's that's the that's the I mean, it. all the things that I that's have. awesome that's to be able it. to say yeah. that like convincingly because when you say it it's like immediately believed and it's credible what's well, unreplicable right, yeah. you can't you can't creativity is that 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 thing you know you can't quantify it you just have it and, and i'm wondering when you realized you you were able to contribute more than just your rapping in a really significant way like had you written for a bunch of people you had these hit records or uh, when you know once i realized like what 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 makes it all worth it for me? Like, what what actually is it that turned me on about this industry and what I'm doing? And it's not it's not the outcome. It's the create. It's it's the creating in the moment. You know what I mean? So I love creating, and so you know to be able to do it on a record or a movie yeah. or write a script or whatever is is what's cool is actually you know it's it's the it's the uh it's the chef that wants to cook the food but might not eat the food you know what i'm saying he just want to curate, set it out and let everybody an else enjoy it yeah. you know what i'm saying so um that's what turns me on so that's that's the engine that keeps everything rolling and that's what keeps me inspired is is the creative process so although I think that's the healthiest place to land for creatives, because as you know, you're, you're just making stuff all the time and you can't become too outcome dependent because mm -hmm. I think that can really fuck with your mind. Surely, though, you want your products to be received well, right? Or, or are you completely indifferent to releasing a song, a movie and, and getting critiqued? Well, I mean, you want it to be received well. I mean... But at the end of the day, it's not up to you. Yeah. Like, um, you know, a person that put a painting on the wall, he can't really care what you think about it. He gone. Like, yep. he's doing the next painting. Yeah. It's you that's looking at it, and you have to interpret it, and you have to live with it and do whatever you're going to do with it. But he's not really concerned because, like, he's off to the next painting you know what i'm saying so it's it's taking that it's taking that attitude but of course you want people to like it you want people to be able to enjoy it over and over and over again um but you know if we watch the same movie at the same time we're not seeing the same movie because the parts that we don't see that we have to make up in our head about the character and about Different. the story it's all different, different yeah. you know. Yeah. In my mind, the character took the bus to the damn spot. Your mind, he, he got a ride from his girl. In his mind, he jumped in his Lambo yeah. and got to the spot. So everybody is seeing a different movie, even if we're watching the same movie. So we can't really be caught up in the outcome. But, but you did do an incredible job of portraying a part of the world that people were very curious about, and that being, you know, uh, uh, South LA, Compton in general, in a time where um, you, you've said in the past, every movie that was coming out, whether it was Colors, whether it was Boys in the Hood, painted the hood out to be this menacing, dark place. And that, from what I understand, that was the reason why you got the confidence and the idea and the creative behind writing Friday. Yeah, because if you live in the hood, you laughing all the time. Yeah. So you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> if this is supposed to be such a dark place, why are we laughing to our side hurt? Because you realize it's, it's just as much comedy in the hood as it is tragedy. Mm. And, and people should see how much fun we had growing up, too, and not just oh my God, you know, everything is terrible. Like, everything is unpredictable. You don't know when it's gonna pop off, but every day is not, you know, hell. So 
that's what we wanted to portray in Friday. Like how much fun we have with this crazy life we're dealing with, you know. When did you make the jump from being this like hardcore hip hop dude to a comedy guy? Or 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 or, or doing the family films? Cause I remember that was that was fascinating to watch, you know, right? Growing up, I mean, you had this prolific hip hop career and, and I mean, you're Ice Cube, you know, fucking yeah. hard motherfucker. And then you come out in these family movies and it was such a, it was such an amazing duality to watch. But did you have to swallow a pill or, 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 or maybe check something in you because you were afraid people were going to not maybe take you as serious anymore if you're doing, you know, comedy and making jokes? Um, no, nah, no. Nah. You know, at the time, you know, we had did Friday, which made people feel the same way. Like, man, you hardcore. How you gonna do a movie like mm. Friday? Yeah. So, but that was R rated, and then and then we did, we did Barbershop, yeah. which was like PG thirteen. So we was like, okay, we could make them laugh. In in R rated, we could make them laugh in a PG thirteen. Can we make them laugh in a PG? Movie? PG, yeah. Just can you can we get the kids? Because I had five year olds running up to me saying, Craig, smoke. And I'm like, damn, you need a little movie for your little ass. You don't need to be watching yeah. Craig and Smoke. Felicia. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So, um, and I realized my my audience had kids. So I'm like, okay, this is a way to stay in the family without 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 pops having to say ice cube man he used to be boy ice cube <laughs> used to be the shit yeah. like you do a movie for the kids now they know you the man and the thing about it these movies live forever so whenever somebody has a kid they're looking for something cool for them to watch and it's like are we there yet are we there yet are we there yet Next thing you know, these kids is 16, 17, 21, 22, 25, and they've been loving you since they was four. Mm. So you still stay relevant. Yeah, for so sure. it's a way to to almost recycle your fans and make sure <laughs> that you're always getting new fans you growing made a, up loving for sure he made a business you. decision it was like it's like the equivalent of a youtuber starting a family channel you know what i'm saying no, like, no, no, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll make like a, a personal relation to this like I, I solely started tiktok because i knew how young the demo was yeah. and, and and as a person in this space like i hate ever like relying on relevancy yeah like to to, to make me feel like I'm I'm doing something important but at the end of the day like what we do you know it's it's if we want to drive the or move the needle it is important to stay relevant right and so it's, I mean it's important to stay interesting bingo yep totally you know Captain what I'm saying I, I like that word better yep like relevant makes it seem like you'll do anything just to, to to get some attention yep. but you know when they see you if you're interesting you should be all right you yeah know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I, I I do think it's important. Like I I'm a I'm a I'm a veteran in this internet space at this point. Like I've been doing this stuff, I get so weird to say it, professionally for like ten years now, like a full yeah. decade, which decade. is still, you know, relatively new, but I'm more aware now of the the type of content I create per platform and the type of audience that it's capturing. And I'm thinking ten years from now, yes. right? When when the when the 10 year old who likes prime uh is 20 they'll have grown up drinking my drink yeah and that's cool you know there's there's a lot of value in that in that longevity it is and you know long as you long as it's authentic kind of sure. you know what i'm saying and it's not you don't want the tail wagging the dog yeah you're good yeah well I, i've been there too yeah you know it's it, it it's a double-edged sword um because i think unlike you i was I was outcome dependent for a while, you know. Uh, I think we all were. We all, you know, you start like that because that's what the business, you know, entails. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They want the outcome. You're not going to make it 10 years if you're not doing the numbers. Yeah. But you get to a point where it becomes about your audience. 
your real audience, not the ones that pop in every now and then, mm. but the ones that's there all the time. Mm. And you just like, hyper feed them and, and everybody else will get in where they fit in. Well, and your name, I feel like, starts to carry weight. You know, like for the longest time, like you're you're looking at all these like uh, vanity numbers, how many followers, all this type of shit. But eventually, like for you two, you know, Cube, you especially, bro, like to be able to say, yo, we got Ice Cube in our movie or we got Ice Cube on this or on this business play, this, this or that. They're not saying like, yo, how many views did he get on his last Instagram story? They don't give a <laughs> fuck about that shit. It's fucking Ice Cube, bro. You know what I'm saying? So I think like eventually that's like the highest tier of celebrity is when you reach a point where your name has legacy clout to it, regardless of what you've done in the past fucking month or, or three days. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what it is? It's, uh, it all comes down to quality. Mm. You know, people want quality. You know, when people pick it up, they want it to be what they used to. You know what I mean? They don't want you to cut corners. So you might not like it all the time, but you know it's going to be quality. You know, yeah. like, it's not going to be bullshit. You know what I'm saying? You might not like every Rolls Royce that come out, but you know it's not a piece of shit. Yeah, right? yeah. You know it's quality. Yeah, yeah. So whenever you decide, you'll go grab one. You know what I mean? Like, so that's really what it's all about. Letting, you know, doing work, giving people quality, never giving them shit you wouldn't buy or take. And, and, um, and being consistent, and um, and then they'll that that name recognition to hold the weight. Like you hear the word Steven Spielberg, and you know you might not love the subject matter, but you know it's not going to be thrown together. The quality is going to be there. Yep. Martin Scorsese, you know the quality is going to be there. Yep. You know what I mean? Antoine Fuqua. Yeah, you know the quality is gonna yeah. be there. And if they miss on one picture, he's they're still who they are. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, you know. Uh, so t to me, that's really what it comes down to: is the quality and people. They like it. They like quality, and then as long as you give them quality, they will uh, continue to support you. And if you do it good enough for a long enough period of time, that, that's that's called brand building. Right? Yes, and, and and then you know. Again, a decade later, you might have a pretty strong brand if you were able to have a lot of hits and a lot of W's along the way. Without a doubt. I'm, I'm curious because you used um, you use uh, music as a vehicle for your creativity, and then it, it, it pivoted uh, uh, to Hollywood, traditional media, and, and then social media came out, right, yeah. uh, to, to, in the early 2000s. Did you ever feeling yourself wanting to express your creativity on social media? Media like did that? Did that um, revolution, uh, like of connectivity? I guess uh, interest you at all? Yeah, um, you know it does. But you know I'm a guy who likes to kind of go in the lab. And then come back out with something cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quality. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I'm not I'm not the, the guy who's like with the cam in the lab showing you how everything is coming together. You know what I mean? I think I just don't feel comfortable with, with people really seeing things unfinished. So, you know, doing something every day didn't really like turn me on, you mm -hmm. know, but I like to I like to use it as a promotional vehicle. Like, yo, this is what's coming. Get ready. Yeah. Here it comes. Yeah. Here it comes. While I, you know, go in the lab and cook up cook up something cool. You know what I'm saying? I'm like a a guy who um you won't see me out a lot. You only see me out if I got something cool to present or yo, I got this coming out or check this out or you know, cause I think that's what it's all about, you know, like who gives a damn if I go to the fucking Oscars and shit if I don't have a movie? Like, is that you know why you're saying? here? Is this why? Is that why you're here right now? Do what? you have something cool going on? Is of it called course, Big Three? Big Three, baby. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah Big Three. You know, um, uh, you know, it's 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 something that's just a passion play. You know, as a fan, is is why the Big Three is here because I wanted to see it. You know, and I felt like there's a lot of cool people. Who want to see something cool in the summer? The summer sometimes is boring as fuck when it comes to sports. Like, you know, like 
I love baseball, but mid-season baseball is like, okay, like preseason football, summer league, NBA, you know, it's like, you know, somebody kill me. Like, um, <laughs> so golf, tell, them what, tell them what big three is. Big three, professional three on three. Uh, basketball, this is our sixth year. Uh, what's cool is we're going around back to arenas. That was how the model was built, going from city to city, um, 12 teams. Uh, we're starting to sell teams too, so uh, we got a couple of couple of cool, um, very smart uh, owners that's you know looking to buy teams and, and put the teams in different cities. So the league is growing, man. You know, back on CBS. And uh, Paramount Plus. Yeah, I was gonna ask where where it airs. CBS Paramount is, is, Plus is all summer long. Yeah, live. Sick. What's going on with the Ball Hogs? Oh man, you <laughs> they're know. having a tough they're having a tough time this <laughs> season, they, bro. Yeah. What are they one in five? five? Well, you know they they haven't <laughs> had a great season <laughs> since our existence. You know what I'm saying? You know they they uh they're like the little giants. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, but but you know they they got a nice fan base. People root for them. And uh, we think this year may be different for them. Well, it don't seem like it so far. <laughs> yeah, you know. Wait, so what's the team that, that keeps winning? What's the, their trilogy. name? Trilogy, bro. Yeah, They're trilogy. nasty. Yeah, yeah. They they just uh, three-peated. Not three-peated, <laughs> but they won three out of five championships. So they're like our little dynasty, you know yeah. what I'm saying, in the league. So it's like this, it's like this half-court, three-on-three, like old-school, like, you know, basketball style but it's also i hesitate to say this because i know i already mentioned the suge knight conspiracy conspiracy thing so i don't want to do it again but when i see it you got the four point zones the four point circle which is so sick yeah and uh, just a tiny piece of it reminds me remember rock and jock back rock in the jock, day yeah, where it was just yeah, fun yeah it was just fun you know yeah. what i'm saying and you'd watch it, it would just be a good time to just watch rock and jock now of course it's not with celebrities it's with real it's retired real ballers. But we, but we have as much fun. Yeah. You know, we can trash talk. Yeah. You know, guys can be themselves. Um, and, hey, you got to come ready to play. Like, if you got any weaknesses, it's going to get exposed. You know what I'm saying? So we've had some NBA guys get locked up out there, and they they was like, this is different. So, right. Yeah, it's its own thing. What you mean locked up? Like physically? Like a leg? I mean, no. I mean, like, <laughs> couldn't score. Oh. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, you can't be a specialist. Can't be a three-point specialist uh, in three-on-three. Three. You got to be able to pass, dribble, shoot, defend. And any any recruits, like dream players you have? Yeah, man. We're we trying to get Boogie Cousins. Tight. We're trying to get Isaiah Thomas. Tight. Uh, Lou Williams. Um, you know, some of the guys who we think should still be in the NBA, but for whatever reason, you know, they're not, they not there. And so they should come play for us. They can showcase their talents uh, on CBS, you know, instead of going overseas when nobody gonna see them play, and um, and get back in the NBA. Isn't isn't uh, Clyde Drexler the he's the commissioner? commissioner. <laughs> That's we so got the sick. coolest commissioner yeah, yeah, yeah. in sports. Yeah, yeah, the only um, the only uh, former athlete to be a commissioner. Yeah. And it's like a traveling thing, right? Like you can go, you can go see city it at. City. It starts again. What June? June twenty fifth. We in Chicago. Then we we're gonna be in New York. We're gonna be in Memphis, uh, Dallas. Um, we're going to Boston, uh, and we got a couple Charlotte, and we got a couple cool announcements uh, for the playoffs and the championship. And you're filming a. Documentary too on that I hope. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. working on a docu series. Cool, cool. Um, with uh, Jesse Collins, you know, who's he, he uh, produced the Oscars last yeah. year, and um, and he produced a uh, Dre Super Bowl. Uh, oh, the show. show. Yeah, the show. Oh, one of the Super greatest Bowl. Yeah, Super Bowl a, shows. He's a big time producer. Uh, we did uh, Hip Hop Squares together, uh, which was on you know a couple of years ago, and so. Yeah, we want to do something cool, show people how hard it is, man. We dealing with we dealing with hate from the NBA. We dealing with Qatari spies and shit. What? That's real. Wait, no. What are you talking about? Qatari spies? Yeah, man. We had some Qatari dudes invest 
And uh, they was fucking spies, and they've been what were they, they spying? They've been fucking with us. <laughs> well, well, they was they was really invested into. I guess guitar want to look like they, you know, into sports and shit. You know, they got the World Cup. Yeah. Same guys that got the World Cup there. These same guys, they invest in the league. Tried to steal our players. Tried to steal our, yeah. you know, staff. So we in we in the court battle Damn, with these clowns. It's war out there, huh? Man, you know we've been squabbing on all fronts. You just don't know. That's why you know I, you got so much hate from traditional sports who don't want to see us in the arena. You know they don't want to see us there because um, we got a cool sport and it's made for the new the new fan. You know our our, our games is over in an hour. You know, no no time clock, first to 50 win. Sick. You know what I'm saying? One-on-one on like, one showdowns. Yeah, one-on-one on one showdowns. Sick. If you don't like a foul, you can be like, yo, fuck that foul. We're going to go one-on-one. On one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's just a cool new way to enjoy basketball. And and it's been hard as hell to, to just get it going. I mean, to get people to uh, stop – fighting us on these different fronts because, yo, you know, our ratings are better than MLS. Our ratings are better than NHL. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, so we got a sport that's making noise. I'm yeah, but aren't you used to that? You got to be used to that by now. Being, of course. Being like one versus many. I, I wouldn't know the world no different. Yeah. Like, this is just a new version of the same song. Um, you know, we, we, did, we dealt with it in music. Movies now we're dealing with it in sports. I'm glad you're making the documentary. I, I mean, you know this obviously by now, but like sometimes seeing the power of media and what it can do, especially to a emerging industry yeah. or or person, anything is unbelievable. Like um the coach the coach prime uh, documentary on, yeah. on I think it's on Amazon. Um, man, I saw I saw a TikTok about stadium attendance before and after coach prime joined and, and and they made the series around it and like man all eyes on him now and his yes. team and his players and, and it really works and i could definitely see something like that happening with big three it's time you know we've been doing this we've been had we've had five great seasons mm. so we plan to have our six but um you know the challenges are there for any young league and so um we just meeting them all head on. So it's cool that people get a chance to see, you know, what we what we going through to really bring the big three on. Mr. Cuba, I had a question. Okay. You smoke weed? Yeah, I do. Are you high right now? No, nah, I ain't high right now. When, when do you decide to smoke? Whenever I ain't doing nothing. Chilling? Like, what do you do for fun? Um, Think of shit to do. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that would just leave me in a loop. Just <laughs> trying to have fun thinking about stuff to have fun. <laughs> yeah, well, so what do you end up doing? Playing chess? Smoking weed? Uh, you know, usually some creative hanging out, you know. Uh me and my wife, we kick it real tough, you know what I'm saying? So What do you guys like to do? Just hang out, you know. Um sometimes we you know, Go 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 karting like it's, it's, nah 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 we, we 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 go cruising and shit you know what I'm saying go hang out at you know we got a spot in the marina go hang out and you know act like kids and shit you, ever, you got a low rider still no no low no, riders no 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 not done with that you got comfy clothes yeah you know I, I usually got some sweats and you know what I'm saying I got yeah, yeah. I got some dope ass uh, some Izod little slippers I usually rock. You, you got, like you cheeseburgers? Got any go to yep. munchies? Yep. I got cheeseburgers too. I like them too. What do you eat for breakfast? Fat burger, baby. Oh, yeah. That's, fat burger, that's yeah. right. What do you eat for breakfast? I don't eat breakfast a lot. Damn. Me neither. Damn. Me neither. Not, a lot of people don't eat breakfast. I fast. Yeah. I fast till Favorite 2 Favorite meal of the day. I probably don't eat till maybe uh, 11 30 noon. I start eating something. You know? Dude, that's when I wake up. That's how you keep the weight off. I, um, I wake up very early, you know what I'm one saying? Of those. Like one of those. What time? 25 and 6 a.m. That's insane. Why? I like to get up early. I, I like um I like the feel of of the stillness of early, early morning. Mm. 
so I can get a lot done, a lot of thinking. You know what I mean? I, I probably, I probably do all my, everything I got to do, pretty much. Seem like before you get up. <laughs> no, for real. Man, I get up at eleven thirty. Yeah, on the East I like that's to have, actually. Crazy, I like to have the bro. rest of my day to just kick it in the afternoon. I don't yeah. want to be working. Well, and in, you want to be thinking about what to what to do. Yeah. creative pursuits. Like, <laughs> Wait, yeah, can I ask about you, what to do? Can I ask you two Friday related questions selfishly? Yep. One is, uh, I read somewhere that Chris Rock was originally considered for Smokey's role. No, no, not Chris Rock. It was. Uh, that's what I read. Damn. It was Tommy Davidson. Oh, yeah. Tommy Davidson. I think it said both of them. It said Chris yeah. Rock, too. I read it on Wikipedia. Yeah. Are they liar? It could be conspiracy. Yeah. yeah. Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. No, nah, no. Nah, nah. But how do you think that would have... Imagine if Chris Rock had done it. Do you think the movie would have been as successful? Nah. No, nah, I don't. You know, I think uh, Smokey was the perfect <sighs> actor at the time, and... Nobody wanted him. Like, the studio didn't want him. The director. He had to do acting lessons, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I had to bring him in to to do a, you know, to sit down with me, and we're going to just kind of go over some lines and riff. And, and when they saw that, then everybody was convinced he was the guy. But I had seen him on um, on uh, Def Comedy Jam yeah. that Russell Simmons used to do on HBO. And, and I was like, this dude got the flavor. He got the flavor of this crazy character. But, you know, originally before any of them, it was supposed to be uh, DJ Pooh. Yeah, your home. Play, who played Red, who helped me write it. He was supposed to be Smokey, but... Um, they pushed him out. New Line, they said he hadn't done any movies, so they, didn't, they, they just didn't see him as, as the co-star having that much screen time and he had never done a movie. Were you were you pissed about that? I was because Pooh was one of the funniest dudes I know. Yeah. So I was like, you're not gonna find nobody funnier than Pooh. And so um they just made us look, you know, they made us look for him. Were though were any of the characters in Friday like inspired by people from your everyday Hell life? Yeah. Who that's you all, that's dude, all. I swear Man, Felicia, no, I gonna, dude, Felicia. I ain't gonna say no names for they come <laughs> yeah. asking for some damn money. <laughs> but yeah, this these are all people throughout my neighborhood, man. Like all this stuff that happened kinda happened throughout growing up. In my neighborhood, you know, I just kind of squoze it into one day. What'd she come asking to borrow? Greg, let me borrow your All toaster. Kind of yeah. <laughs> your toaster. Yeah, that was uh, that was that was one of my neighbors. I don't want to say her name because she gonna be mad at me. <laughs> Borrowing all kind of shit. I'm like, damn, she ain't got no limit. <laughs> I want to ask you what I guess one last question on West Coast shit. Um, we talked about the past and the history of NWA and and you know all the stuff that happened pre, but post, do you see anybody specifically carrying the torch uh, for West, Ho West Coast hip hop right now? You watch it, do you yeah. pay attention? I don't pay a lot of attention, you know? I mean, it's competition at the end of the day. So, yeah. but you know, Kendrick is great. Um, see what his tour did? Yeah. Like the highest grossing tour of all time. Amazing. Hip hop, hip hop tour. Amazing. Whoa. So, um, yeah, I'm not worried about it. You know, um, we got a lot of creative people out here that uh, love hip hop. Not only, you know, down here, but in Northern California too. So, you know, I, I just know whoever comes is gonna be creative and you're not gonna, you're not gonna make noise unless you're very creative. So you gotta be, you know, to, 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 to carry the torch. I yeah. have a question. Yeah. Another one. <laughs> Go for it. After all, it's a podcast, you know, yeah. and I'm here to ask the tough questions, Mr. Q. Go for it, man. Um, but we can cut this if it's too sensitive. I'm, I'm just curious because I think we've seen so much turbulence in the past three years in um, society, traditional media, social media, um, specifically with the vaccine, especially recently. And on my PDF here, it says that you bailed from a movie because you didn't want to get the vaccine. And I remember at the... I mean, I didn't bail from the movie. They What the fuck, Dylan? No, they, no, no, they no. They kicked it's, me off yeah. the movie. Okay, okay, okay. They yeah. refused so, 
to you know allow me to do the movie. So even even more kind of on the on the point of what I was saying, a lot of people uh, back then who didn't want to or didn't feel comfortable getting the vaccine and putting this thing in their body that we are finding out now didn't know enough about got canceled like literally like from a job or on social media or whatever yeah and 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 it they were so targeted and even like I, i'm uh, hesitant to even say it on this podcast because of potentially the implications of what it'll do for uh uh this episode and, don't be a bitch just I, say I, 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 i'm just i'm just i'm just wondering do you feel do you feel any type of way about like the hypocrisy or backpedaling of society now that we're finding out that there's a lot of holes that can be, be poked in the effectiveness of these vaccines that we're just finding out now that back then were forced on a lot of people and a lot of people got in a lot of trouble because they didn't put this foreign substance in their body. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's a shame. It's a shame that you was even worried about saying that. You know what I mean? That that. It's a shame they got us all hesitating on just to talk about something. Stuff we know is true in our true feelings. Mm. Like that's what we got to get out of us. Like we can't be hesitating on our true feelings. We got to say what we mean, mean what we say. If people get mad, so what? You know, that's they that's their um own issue. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, um I'm not anti-vaccine. I, I've been v vaccinated before, you know, many times throughout my life. But after the studies, after the the you know, the the time allowed it for the, for the drug to, to be discovered if it's effective or not, is it harmful or not? Yeah. You know, 10, 15 year studies on on the medicine you're putting inside of you. So when somebody come with a Johnny come lately concoction, you know what I'm saying? It just didn't sit right with me personally. I didn't speak and tell anybody my business. I think that's another problem that that whoever told my business to the world, um, you know what I mean, felt that it was cool to be able to tell everybody, oh yeah, Ice Cube didn't get vaxxed. You know, that was something I wasn't going to say to anybody, but it came out through other sources, which I think is bullshit, too. You know, when when people are telling uh, your medical business publicly, That's you know what I mean? That's Employers. Hitler, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, so so it's a lot of problems on a lot of fronts. It's an individual choice. It sucks that people were pushed out of their jobs, uh, canceled family members not uh, associating with their own family because of this. And that's what was stolen from us that we got to get back. We got to speak our mind. We got to uh, let people make their own decisions with their own uh, body. And we got to, uh, you know, really stop telling everybody business you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's, it's a saying, if you mind your own business, you live longer. And it's fucking true. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It's true. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I think we're going to look back at this era specifically and realize how confused we are. Yeah, as, don't as censor as yourself. Like, you know, you know. Don't I, censor I, yourself, I, man. I, Just, like, we got we to gotta let it all hang out. You know what I mean? We gotta let it all hang out. Don't censor yourself. That's 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 the beginning and the end for everybody, for all of our individuality. Do you want to know the issue that we struggle with? That's a little bit different than the one that you guys did when you originally weren't censoring yourselves. You said what you wanted to say, whatever you felt, whatever you wanted to to get out, and the record label would put that shit out because you guys were either like you know close with the execs, and I bet you sometimes they wouldn't, right? But the majority no, of time, put out like, everything. What, right. So maybe Death yeah. Row or whoever put out everything, right? But we are kind of at the uh, mercy of the platforms. Yes. And so it's not about a desire to censor anything. But unfortunately, the way the world works nowadays, either you're going to censor it or they're going to censor it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so, and so 
Uh, me, not as much. I used to smoke crack. I do enjoy fucking porn stars. I'm a sick man. <laughs> Cube, I'm a sick man. Dude, I did heroin for a long time. I'm a fucked up yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. So I just say whatever the fuck I want. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we got global super celebrities that got to think a couple times before they say some shit. But I'm happy that you sat here and you told him that because I think he's in, he's been he's moving back in that direction, I feel like. Why don't you say something fucked up right now? Say something, say something. Just say something I mean, real random. You know, it, manager something Jeff's right there going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. Say something so I'm gonna fucking say something. I'm going to say something crazy. I, 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 I voted for <laughs> Fuck. Oh, well, shit. I would have gone that. I don't know. Fuck. I don't, well, damn. I didn't think that was going to be the thing you were going to say. I think I made a mistake. Yeah, maybe. Why don't you say. I think I made a mistake. We'll try again. Maybe. Oh, yeah. You must be really proud of your son. Very. I'm proud of him. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, it's uh I don't even know. It's beyond words, you know. It's beyond words. He's uh he's a good dude and that's really what it's all about, you know. I feel like you can tell. I, I watched straight out of Compton and I saw this guy playing you. At, at, at one point I thought it was a, a like a CGI younger version of you that you were playing and then I realized it, it's your son and he killed it, right? Yeah. And there must be a tremendous amount of weight on his shoulders to to nail this role, especially because he's your son. Exactly, and he you killed know, it. And I approached him to do it. You know, he would. Uh, I mean, he wasn't doing nothing but having fun, spending my money, thinking about what to you do. Know what I mean, just <laughs> loving life. And um, he would go on tour with me, and um, I would I would let him do a song or two with me. And so he's, I'm like, he's killing it. And so, so I knew he had the swagger to do the stage performance and and all that. And um, I approached him. I'm like, "Yo, it looked like the straight out of Compton movie is gonna be real, and um, I want you to play me." Damn. And he looked. He was like, <laughs> he was like, "Okay." And that I was like, that that just came off a little too easy. <laughs> okay. He walked on and shit. He had his cereal. And I'm like, nah. So I said, okay, I'm gonna make him quit. Cause I don't I'd rather for him to quit now and not and then then do a half ass job. So I start putting him through, you know, the ringer, you know. I'm like, you got you got acting, you got got some some acting coaches here in LA and then and yeah, I got an acting coach for you in New York. And and he's like, oh, okay, I'm with it. I'm with it. So then it got to a point where he started to want to go to the acting coaches and shit. So it I'm backfires. Like, like, okay, so he might be serious. But then I had to tell Gary Gray, who directed the movie. He directed Friday too, a couple of my videos, like it was a good day. So when I told him, I said, uh, I want my son to play me, he almost lost it. Yeah, he was sure. like, Cube, <laughs> damn, man. I thought we was making a real movie. Uh, That's some bullshit. Uh, what you mean? I said, dude, I would not ask him, I would not put him in this position if I didn't think he could do it. I said, you gonna help him just like John Singleton helped me. I wasn't no damn actor. You gonna help him just like John helped me get all the way through it, and he was like, oh. "I said he'll audition, he'll go through the whole ringer. If the, if if the movie companies say he can't do it, he don't do it." So he went through the whole process. Now my son say when he got there to audition, he said it was four other dudes dressed like Ice Cube supposed to. <laughs> Audition yeah. too, so he got mad. Then he was like, "They thought they was gonna take this mm -hmm. out my mouth. Mm -hmm. They thought they was gonna uh, go in there and kill this role over me." And so he got fired up. He went in there, killed it. Was the best person for the part. Got the job, and you know, rest is history. But it also yeah. it makes sense too because it just it's like another marketing aspect for the film. Like I remember when they when they. Uh, Casted James Gandolfini's son to play Tony Soprano in the in the uh, uh, Saints of Newark. Yeah, and it was just like, dude, and and I mean, bro, like comparatively, like imagine having to play your father who's since passed, bro. Yeah, that's in great. his main, bro, in in the role that defined his career, like that yeah. was so much pressure on that kid. No doubt to go in there and do that. And I don't, I don't, I don't know if 
he did as good of a job as your son did. But like, dude, there's just so much like there's got to just be so much pressure on their shoulders in that in that role. It is, you know, and um, I mean, getting it right is 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 that much relief too, you know, just the fact that it's working, and um, and you know, he did it. You know, what I'm saying he he stepped up. He did. You know, it's it's nothing like a father asking his son to step up and do something bigger than he's ever done, and and he he fucking does it. Got and then you be like, see, that's me. You know what I mean? You're like, that's what I would have did if I was him. And that is you because that's your son. Did you think he did a good job of playing you? I thought he did, he did an amazing job. Sick. Incredible. But now he's in Cocaine Bear. Yeah, now he's in, you know, he's doing <laughs> movies bigger than me. He's like Star Wars, Godzilla. Damn. Yeah, he's Damn. like uh, bona fide. Yeah, for real. Well, what next, man? What are you going to do? Go home? Chill out? Think of what to do next? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Go to the house. You know what I'm saying? I got some workers over there working on my fountain, so I got to oh, yeah? make sure they, you know. Well, what are they doing to it? Adding some lights to it and, you know, making it, you know, just look a little more, more attractive. Boss. Yeah. More boss. <laughs> yeah. You got a Vespa? No, what is that? Scooter. No. You going to give me one? All right, bring it out. Sponsor. Bring out the Vespa. Bring out the Vespa. Out. Vespa. Sponsor. Say again. Oh, oh, so yeah, we have Kevin Hart right on after you. What? Yeah. yeah. That motherfucker owe me some money. Right, actually, Ooh. oh, we're going to tell him. We're going to tell him. We're going to yeah, tell him yeah. that. Tell him you owe me a dollar. Yeah, we'll tell him. <laughs> yeah. What, what, is, what does he owe you a dollar for? Because uh, I bet him that he was going to end up being more friends with Rock than me no way. after he did one movie and his groupie ass is over there with the rock <laughs> and left me behind yeah. but only one dollar huh a dollar you know rich people only bet a dollar you saw yeah. trading places yeah. <laughs> he didn't see trading places go see trading places man We'll get a dollar. We'll get yeah, a dollar. Yeah. Get a dollar. I want no. I want him to wire me a fucking dollar. I need the <laughs> right, yeah, we'll bank make, to go yeah. through some shit. Respect. All right, all right. Well, we'll tell him to fucking pay up. Make sure you get your uh, account number and routing number to Dylan. Yep. And we can get Kevin to wire you a dollar. I'll make that my mission. No problem, man. Big three. I want it all in pennies too. A <laughs> <laughs> hundred, a hundred wires of one penny. Yes. That's hard. <laughs> No, Big Three is coming June 25th, 25th. Chicago, CBS. We on all summer long, you know, Saturdays and Sundays on CBS. Either one, you know, not both days, but throughout the summer, one of those days. So the weekends is the Big Three weekends, baby. You got, something to, you got something to do now besides just think about what you're going to do yeah. next. <laughs> I'm about to think about what I'm going to do next. <laughs> Have a whole lot of fun. Hell yeah. Thanks for coming on, man. Anytime, man. Yeah, Anytime, man. Salute on what you're doing, man. Thanks, uh, Thank you. Been watching you and uh, impressed. And uh, keep doing it, man. Keep keep trailblazing. Trying. Trying, man. All right, guys. Thank you for listening to this episode of Impulsive. Make sure you check out everything Ice Cube is doing. Hit that subscribe button. Click this video a thumbs up. We'll see you next time. Take it easy. Peace. Yeah, yeah.